Wow, it feels great to be with you all this morning. You know, I noticed, I was looking during praise and worship, the sign behind me said, welcome home. And that's the way I feel today. I hope you feel that way. What a great place to be. And uh, just exciting praise and worship. You have, your pastors are awesome. And uh, I'm just glad to get to know them and spend time. And, and, um, and then your partnership with Convoy of Hope. It's just, it's amazing. Thank you so much. And when, when we had that discussion two weeks ago, you know, he, he texted me and I read the text and I thought, well, how do I respond without sounding like I'm begging, like I want to come? <laughs> so I just said, hey, anything you need, let me know. Videos, uh, if you need some more pictures, if you need resources. And by the way, I could come too. And uh, so... Maybe he picked up on that, and that's why I'm here today. But I think it was God's plan for me to be here today, and loving it. And uh, you guys are just so refreshing. And so thank you. Again, thank you for being great partners with Convoy of Hope. And I wanted to take just a few minutes right up front just to explain to you everything that Convoy of Hope is. Because I found out, you know, a lot of people know one or two things that we do, but they don't know the breadth of what we do. We're, we're in over 21 countries around the world. And that is, that's it's just like it's mind-boggling to me because I remember the days when we had one pickup truck and we were going to grocery stores and we were getting rejects out of the grocery store, you know, the dented cans, uh, things that didn't look. And, and we were getting all that together and we we're putting them in little grocery bags and driving a pickup truck into the inner cities. Uh, of Northern California on church parking lots and passing them out. That's kind of how Convoy of Hope started. And so it was from that little small beginning that God has just blown this thing up. And uh, 21 different countries, uh, over 2,200 program centers within those countries, and it's just, it's just amazing. So let me take just a few minutes and just run through the different areas, again, that you're involved of, Involved with, we would never could have done it without you. And because you were doing this, the first one is feeding program. Isn't that a great picture? I mean, that that picture says it all. Just oh wow! So every single school day in in over twenty one different countries, or you're going to hear me say over. So let me let me just confess something to you right up front. Thursday, this past week, I got our brand new numbers for the year. So everything I'm telling you is, is at the beginning of the year. So as we're winding down the year, we're getting all the reports from our field. It's just, when I saw it, I just couldn't believe, I said, are you sure you're not counting twice? You know, one of those things. Are you sure this is true numbers? And uh, our numbers are just through the roof. And I haven't been given the the permission to share all the new numbers yet because we're vetting them. We're going to put them into a nice program anyway. But uh, I can tell you that we're over, we're over 400,000 right now. Uh, as of today, we're feeding children every single school day. And it's just amazing. And, and what happens is, you know, we, we feed these children and, and most of the kids that come to school, this is the only meal of the day they're going to eat. And, and what our feeding program does, it really invites us into that child's family. And we're affecting the entire family. So they come to school, they're getting a great education, they're getting clean water, they're getting a meal. Every single day they're getting a presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's just amazing, our teachers that are involved with us. And, uh, and we're in some of the places that a lot of people aren't allowed to go. And I can't honestly tell you why we're there other than the government recognizes that we're feeding their children and taking care of their children. So they've opened the doors up to us and they've allowed us to come in and you're having an effect on that with us. And it's fantastic. The next slide is our, is our agriculture program. And a lot of people are surprised about this, but this actually started a number of years ago when I was in Haiti and, 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 and like in other countries like Haiti, you look out and you see these barren fields, just brown dirt everywhere, no crops. And uh, so we sat down with some farmers and asked them, you know, 
you know, the problems they were having. They, they told us they don't know how to grow crops in the soil. And soil is different everywhere. No matter where you're at, soil is different. And I don't know a thing about soil. So we hired someone that did. Um, a doctor in agriculture. He put together a team. We call him Dr. Dirt. And because he's just a guy who knows everything about dirt. And uh, so we started going into all of our countries and teaching agricultural practices and we're resourcing them with the right tools they need to grow crop in their soil that they have. And it's amazing to see these farmers now that are able to go to market with all these vegetables and sell them. And we're going to a place you would never thought of. You know, just a couple years ago, I went to Kenya at the base of Mount Suswa. And it's basically tribesmen, herdsmen that uh, and the, they knew very little about growing crops. And I'm an inner city boy. I, I'm not, I don't like to camp out. It's just not my thing. I don't hunt. I just, it's, it's not my thing. And uh, uh, I've shot guns before, but never at animals. So, you know, it's just, I don't do that. But on this particular trip, we, we had to camp out for seven days at the base of Mount Suswa because there were no hotels around. There were no restaurants around. It's just me and all the scary animals I heard every single night. And, uh, and I was deathly afraid of snakes. I just knew any moment I was going to get by, bit by a black mama. <laughs> mama. Uh, so, but we, uh, we built greenhouses. And now when we go back, they have multiplied those greenhouses. And they're just jam-packed with vegetables. And, and, and then another thing that's happened is a lot of our countries where we have our feeding programs, we're actually buying beans and rice from these farmers that are growing crop. So we're giving back into the economic situation that they're in. So it's just a remarkable blessing, a remarkable story. The next slide shows our, our women empowerment program. So, you know, like I said, feeding program really opens the door up to the entire family. So now these mothers that are bringing their children to school, they're sticking around and we're, we're teaching them micro enterprise. We're, we're walking them through a six month program on, 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 on micro enterprising. And, and then what we do is we figure out what it is that they could do, that they could sell that would bring income into their family, a lot of, you know, jewelry or, or we give them chickens, so they can sell eggs, we give them pigs so they can have pig, and uh, you know whatever it is that they need, we'll supply that to them. But it, it's something that they have set through; they have earned, they have earned the, the the right to have it. And we monitor them, we watch them. It's a remarkable program to see these ladies in these at-risk communities. A lot of them single mothers, and they have no income, and all of a sudden their whole life changes. Unbelievable. The next slide is our, our girls program. And again, a lot of these uh, at-risk communities we're in, it's the girls, these young girls that are paying a heavy, heavy price. And we, we, just, we had to do something because it was breaking my heart seeing these girls at 12, 13, 14 years old being married off because of the income that they can bring to their family. And it's just a sad situation. So we've gone in, we've started these programs. And this is one of the areas I'm really pumped about if when I get to share the numbers of how many girls are in that program now, um, you know, it's, it's somewhere shy of <coughs> 35,000. Uh, so it's just, it's remarkable, just remarkable. And what I did share for the first service, we don't have a slide up here for boys. And some of you say, why didn't you do anything with the boys? I, I don't know, but we started this year. So now this year we've piloted a, piloted a program in one of our countries and they have over 100 boys at this one center and from that we're gonna multiply that in all of our countries. It's, it's, it's remarkable. The next slide um, you know, shows the one thing that we do, have done a lot of until COVID is our big city outreaches across the country. And I've had the, the honor to really be a part of that for the last 20, uh, 25 years. And uh, it's just, it's, it's remarkable when you pull, you know, you pull a hundred churches together of different denominations, you pull all these volunteers together, over a thousand volunteers, you train them. We spend about seven to eight months of preparation before each event. And people say, does it take that long to get ready? Yeah, it does. But what we're trying to do more than anything else is establish union 
and relationship, unity amongst those churches that have never worked together before in their community. And then it's just remarkable what happens. We'll have 25 or so different services, you know, haircuts, free shoes, veteran services, uh, health services, and it gets on and on and on and on. We give out free food at each one of the events. But the, the, the thing I like most about this is before they give out the free food, after they have spent an hour, hour and a half, it's like a carnival. You know, you've got hot dogs and hamburgers and everything's free. We, have, we, we really instill into our volunteers to treat every guest as you was a special guest of honor. So we're loving on them. We're treating them with honor. And uh, it's just amazing to see the transformation that takes place. And I've heard it enough in, a, in enough different places to know that God's spirit is on the site. Because guests will say things like, I don't know what it is I feel here, but I feel good. And uh, it's that unification of the church of Jesus Christ coming together for a purpose and a cause. And uh, so before they get their groceries, we always ask them, is there anything we can pray with you about today? It's just a very simple, non-threatening, hey, can we pray with you? And 70% of the guests that come to our outreach events say, yes, I need prayer for something. And it's just, it's remarkable to see the transformation that takes place inside that prayer tent as we pray with our guests. And then the last slide is, is pretty much what we have become known for. And that is our response teams. And these guys, we've got response teams both here domestically and internationally. And they, and they both operate out of Springfield, Missouri. So we're monitoring disasters almost every day around the world. And this is a great team of young, crazy people. Let me tell you how, you know, these guys are, they're just, I can't do what they do. I mean, they, so like when, when Irma was coming in, so we, we were tracking the storm and we knew within two days where that storm was gonna land. So we got 19 tractor trailers loaded with supplies, food, cleaning supplies, all kinds of things. And we had a convoy going all the way down to Shreveport, Louisiana. We found a big church that we could park all of our vehicles on. And then that team rode out that hurricane in Shreveport. And it got pretty bad in Shreveport. And as soon as the storm was over that next morning, they got in those trucks and they split up and they went different places and they went to church parking lots, partnered with churches, and immediately brought help to the communities. And again, we bring help, but every time we pass out a, a package of water or food or cleaning supplies or, or tools, we're also saying, can we pray with you? We want to pray with you. And, and the percentage is pretty high during times of disaster. People want prayer. And we want to make sure that the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, is right on the front line praying with people and for people. Amen? Amen. The next slide is just, uh, just kind of a recap. And uh, again, we're going to update this here before too long. You can see we're in over 22 or 2,100 uh, program centers. The number on here that just blows me away is we have been able to serve over 163 million people have been served. And again, it's just not with tangible things that we have served them. We have served them as servants of Jesus Christ, presenting the true source of happiness and hope they can find in their life found in Jesus Christ. Well, I want to share one more video, and this just kind of caps everything I'm talking about here and just kind of shows you a little bit more of who we are and what we're doing. Prepare for mass evacuation. Devastated the region. Look at the world. Online, in the news, on your drive home from work, you see it. People are suffering. They're doing their best, but it doesn't seem to matter. They feel completely alone, asking, how am I ever going to make it? Is there anyone out there who cares about me? We say yes. At the heart of Convoy of Hope's work is our driving passion to use kindness as a force for change. We are the volunteer delivering relief after a disaster. We are the haircut or a fresh pair of shoes. We are the multitude of people who care about their neighbor and want to do something meaningful that may just impact another person's eternity. So look at the world again. Really look at it. Through the hardship and despair and hurting is a hope that is waiting, demanding, to burst forth. 
And it's not complicated. We believe that the problems that are plaguing the world can begin to be solved one small act of kindness at a time. Every meal served, every seed planted, and every smile sincerely given adds to the revolution of compassion we are so proud to be a part of. So look at the world one more time. The problems are big, no doubt, but the solution, oh, it's beautifully simple. And you, you're a part of it. Isn't that great? You, you are a part of it. Everything that we do, we do because of, of, of what you're helping us do. There's two, two points out of that video I want to touch upon real quick this morning. Uh, how many football fans do we have? You going to be all right this morning? All right. It's 10 minutes till noon. We're not going to hold you too long, but uh, uh, just stick with me. All right. I told the pastor last week I was at a church, and it was about this time, and uh, about noon, and I was warned that this might happen, and it happened. There were about 10 people that just got up and walked out at noon, because the Cowboys were coming on. And uh, so I don't know what time the Cowboys play today, but uh, just stick with me. Two points I want to bring out real quick. It is kindness matters and a revolution of compassion. Kindness matters. You know, I have, have seen over the last 24 years or so, thousands and thousands and thousands of people that a simple act of kindness has opened up their life and opened up their heart to hear the presentation of Jesus Christ. And uh, I want to tell you two stories real quick. One story is, is, I was at an outreach event not long ago, and it was a big inner city, and it was an outreach that we had, at the end of the day, we had about 8,000 guests come out to. We had almost 1,000 volunteers. It was quite the sight at this big park. And... Uh, uh, so as, as we kicked off the outreach, we opened up the gates, we were allowing the guests to come in, and as soon as they come in, they go to the picnic area where they can get hot dogs and hamburgers, and then they make their way to the various services that they would like to partake in uh, before they get their free groceries. So I was at the welcome area, and I noticed this, this lady, and she had a small boy with him. She looked pretty rough, and sure enough, when I introduced myself to her, she was rough. She wasn't nice. She didn't want to really greet me. Her little boy was just expressionless, and, and you could tell that, you know, this kid was having a tough life. She was having a tough life, and uh, it became obvious real quick. She was still kind of hung over from the night before, and she just said, listen, we don't have any food. We heard you guys are giving away food today. We just want to get groceries, and I got to go home. And I said, okay, let's do that. So I said, I'll help you. So we started walking down through the midway. And again, if you can imagine, it's just huge midway with all these tents and all these services. But the first place we walked by was the picnic area, and they could smell the hot dogs and hamburgers. And I said, hey, you want to sit down? We can eat a hot dog and a hamburger. And, you know, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. People say, who eats hot dogs and hamburgers at 9 o'clock in the morning? You know who eats hot dog and hamburgers at 9 o'clock in the morning? Hungry people. And uh, so she said, yeah, we're hungry. So we sat down, and we had a hamburger, and it has, they had a hot dog, and, and then they had another hot dog, and they had another hot dog, and they were full. So she said, okay, thank you so much. Uh, she didn't really say it that nice, but, you know, I got the point. She said, okay, I want my groceries. I said, let's go get groceries. So we started walking to the grocery area, and, you know, off to my right-hand side, there was the huge kids' zone mammoth. They had over 20 inflatables in there, jumping up and down, all the inflatable games you can imagine. They had carnival games in there. They had popcorn and snow cone and cotton candy in there for the kids. It was huge. And I said, you know what, is there any way that I can just take your son in there just for a few moments? I promise you, just a few minutes, and just so he can, you know, play a little bit. And she reluctantly said yes, so I found a shade and a chair, and I placed her in that chair in the shade. And and off we went into the kid zone. And he immediately got into that kid zone, and the kids started coming out in him. You could, you could start talking, okay, this, he is a kid at heart. I, this, this is a little boy. So we, we played in the jump houses. We played carnival games. We got cotton candy. We got popcorn. We got snow cones. He had it all over him. He's just, kid was having a time in his life. I had it all over me. And, uh, and about 45 minutes later, we walk out of that kid zone, and uh, by then, I knew what her name was. Barb was not happy. 
And uh, she said, you said a few minutes. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. But the little boy was just jumping up and down and telling his mom all about the stuff that he did. And, and she said, okay, let's go get the groceries. And she just wanted groceries. I said, let's go get the groceries. We're going that way right now. So we took off. Remember the last place they come to before they get their groceries? So right in front of that prayer tent, we have spent months training those volunteers how to pray with guests and how to minister to them uh, in, in, in the area of hope. So we get to the front of the tent. And I just say, okay, Barb, we're getting groceries right now. But can I just ask you a question before we get your groceries? Is there anything we can pray with you about today? And she kind of laughed. She said, look at me. Yeah, I'm a mess. I need prayer. I said, good. So I got some ladies that were inside the tent. They came over. They greeted her. They took her inside the tent where we had circles of chairs set up. They began to pray with her. We also inside that tent had a children's craft area where they had children's workers that are presenting the gospel of Jesus to the child through a craft. And it was remarkable, remarkable. 20, 30 minutes, I sat there and I watched it. I didn't leave and I, I was watching Barb just being ministered to. And you could tell the Lord was doing something very special in Barb's life uh, through, those, through those ladies. And uh, so I slipped over and I just said, Barb, they're giving away free tennis shoes over here. Can I take your son and let's go get a new pair of shoes? And yeah, 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 let, yeah, let's do that. I mean, something about brand new pair of shoes. Everybody gets excited about that, amen? Even some men get excited about that. Um, so yeah, we went over and got a new pair of shoes. And uh, so we were inside the shoe tent. And one of the unique things that we do, do inside the shoe tent is we got the volunteers working in twos. So we have the child sit down in a chair. And they'll ask, what size shoe do you wear? And they don't know. They measure his feet. And then we have another volunteer sitting on the ground with a pail of water and a clean washcloth. We take the shoes, we take the socks off that child, and we wash their feet. It's remarkable. It's, it's probably one of the most moving things I, I see at the outreaches over and over and over again. And, you know, the, 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 the children don't know why we're washing their feet, but we know why we're washing their feet. We're washing the feet of the city, Jesus Christ. And so we wash the feet, and, and then we got a new pair of clean socks, bright white socks, and we put the socks on. And then we put those new shoes on, and he just came to life. Again, the dignity of getting a brand new pair of shoes. And for the most part, they have never had a brand new pair of shoes. And uh, so, they, so we hipped hop and ran and jumped all the way back to the prayer tent where mom was, and, and she'll still be administered to. And I, I motioned to the ladies, just keep her there. We're going to get a haircut. So I took the little boy, went to the haircut tent. He got a haircut, and uh, he looked sharp and went back and... Long story short, Barb, Barb's life was transformed that day. From the time she walked into that site until the time that she left, she found Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ totally, totally changed her life. That wasn't the end of the story. That, that, that church got involved in Barb's life. They, they found the things that she needed. They came along. They walked the journey with her. They helped her. Two years later, I went back to that same city to do a follow-up outreach. And in every outreach city we go to, we always pair up somebody from our national office, a director, with someone locally that helps call all the shots and helps us pull the strings. So when we got back there two years later to, to the outreach, you know who the outreach director was? Barb. Unbelievable. What a change. What a change. Another quick story is uh, uh, we have what we call field teams. There are short-term mi short missions teams that go to our 21 different program countries, and they'll do whatever that program center needs usually built. That's what the project will do is we'll build that project. Most of the time, they're kitchens. Uh, so we go in, we, we build, and, and I was telling Pastor, I would love for you guys to come alongside of us at some point in the future when we open back up internationally and uh, bring a field team in and, and help us. Uh, it, there's something unbelievable that takes place when you're working on one of these teams. You know, one of the things we do every morning is we have prayer time with our teams before we go into the field, and we just say, God, we know what we're here to do. But send people on our path today, guide our path, show us who we need to talk to, give us the anointing, and off we go. 
Well, we went uh, right after the hurricane in Puerto Rico. We went into Puerto Rico, and, and it was a mess. Um, next to the Joplin tornado, which was the most devastation I've ever seen in my life, um, this community at the, at the top of the mountain in Puerto Rico was just totally flattened, just devastated. And no one was helping them because it was a really poor community. And I said, we're going to do it. We're, so we sent our, our field teams up there, and we started building homes, rebuilding some of these homes. And there was about 30, I think like 38 of them that were destroyed. So we just built, instead of building wood homes, we built cinder block homes and that could withstand the wind. And so we started rebuilding these homes. And within a few days of being there, we met this older gentleman by the name of Ramon because he was just being nosy. He was walking around trying to figure out what we were doing. And come to find out, he didn't like us. He didn't like us there. He was mad at God because God destroyed the community, destroyed his house. And uh, he was just an angry, angry old man, just an angry old man. And, uh, but every single day when the field teams would go there and work, we would always go out of our way to find Ramon. And we would always say, hi, Ramon, we're here, to, we're building such and such house today. And, and you know, yeah, yeah, whatever, he just, yeah, yeah, yeah. He just wasn't a nice guy. And, uh, but as we started getting closer to where he lived, <clears throat> he started we, we started, we really got to know Ramon. And actually, I looked forward, and the team was looking forward every day to see Ramon. And uh, we did some, some sidewalk Sunday school programs for the kids, and he'd come around and see all that. And, and uh, he, he softened up. And, and one day, uh, right before we got to his house, and I asked him if we could rebuild it, and he said, why are you doing all this? No one else cares for us. We said, but Jesus does. And Jesus sent us here to, be, to rebuild your home. And he sent us here to tell you about his love and his grace. And uh, after a few days of that, Ramon accepted Jesus Christ in his life. That was a great story, just remarkable, remarkable story. And we got to his house, we started rebuilding his house, and he was living in a little corner part of his house with the blue tarp. He had his wife, he had his daughter, he had a son-in-law, and they had four of their of children, his grandchildren, all living in this little bitty area. And uh, there was a lot of depression during that time in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, people lost it. They didn't have water, didn't have electricity. It was just a lot of depression. And tr- tragically, we found out one morning that Ramon's son-in-law killed his daughter. So he lost his daughter, son-in-law's in jail, He's an old, old man, and he's got these four small grandkids that now he's responsible for. Make things worse, a few days after that, we f- he found out he had terminal cancer. And uh, so we, we got busy. We built his home, and, and we prayed with him every single day and made sure that, that Jesus Christ was the center of his life, and he assured us, and he, he was. He was. He was transformed, you could tell. Um, he said, hey, I was reading the Bible that you gave me, and it said something about being baptized. I would like to be baptized. I said, Ramon, we can do that. But the only problem was he'd gotten so weak, he literally could not sit up. He was so weak with cancer. And um, so I know this may be challenging to some of your theologies, but instead of taking him to water, we brought water to him. And uh, so we brought a big basin. We brought a big pitcher of water. And one of the team members that was with us that day just happened to catch it on his cell phone. And I want you to see this. Del Padre y Espíritu Santo. Si en este mundo he ofendido a alguien, le pido perdón. Que Dios me perdone y reciba mi nombre en el libro de la vida me bautizo para hacer la voluntad del Señor en el nombre del Padre y del Espíritu Santo Amén Señor bautizo a Ramón en el nombre del Padre y del Espíritu Santo voy con Señor que hoy I mean just unbelievable um, you can imagine we're just weeping as we're doing this. And uh, can, I, can I tell you that just a few days after that video was shot, Ramon died. And Ramon is in heaven today because of kindness. 
because of kindness of people who would not give up just because he was a mean, ornery old man. We kept showing kindness and love and demonstrating Christ. And you know, we're, we're supposed to have kindness. Kindness is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Amen? And we're supposed to have it. I mean, that's the one thing that sets us apart from the rest of the world is we're supposed to be the kindest people around, the happiest people, not grouchy. Turn to your neighbor and say, kindness matters, and then smile at them. Yes, and tell them, don't be a grouchy Christian. You know, I just want to illustrate real quick. You know, as, as a child, I was, I was trapped in a, in a pit of circumstances that, you know, it was abusive situations, ungodly environment. It, it was about as messed up as you can ever imagine a little child having to live through and live in. Um, I, I grew up in that. And because of that, um, I... I Drugs and alcohol became just a way of life for me, just a way to cope. And I was caught in what I refer to as a cycle of hopelessness. And uh, some of you may not know what that is. Some of you know what it is because you've been there. It's a cycle of hopelessness. It's a cycle that you want to get out of, but you can't. There's just no freedom. You, just, you don't know how to get out. And it usually takes someone to intervene. It, Jesus Christ can set you free from that cycle. But it just takes someone just to come in and say, you know what? You don't have to be like that anymore. I was caught in that cycle of hopelessness. I was doing things my, my parents did. I was doing things because of the abuse I was going through. And I just kept doing them over and over and over again. And I knew they were wrong. I knew that it was destroying my life. And it's not that I didn't care. Again, it's just like, didn't know how to stop. I didn't know how to get out. So I was a student in high school, and, and one, one day I was eating lunch. And I was eating lunch in the cafeteria at the loser's table. You, you guys remember that loser's table at school? Yeah. I was, I was there. I was sitting at that loser's table. I was the expendable. I was the one that didn't matter to anybody. And those are the kind of people that sit at that table. So I was sitting there, and an older gentleman came into the lunchroom, and I noticed he had a bunch of the students with him, and they're all sitting down at a table, and they're eating lunch and having a good time. And for whatever reason, to this day, I don't know, whatever reason, he came over to the loser's table, and he said, hey, you want to come over and join us for lunch? It's like, yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, those are the popular kids. And uh, so I went over, I sat down, all those students, man, they loved on me. They say, hey, man, thanks for having lunch with us today, and and the, the guy said, hey, after school day, a bunch of us are going to McDonald's. you mind if I pick you up? You go to McDonald's with us? I'll buy you a hamburger. I thought, wow. I, I hadn't had too many McDonald's hamburgers in my life. And so I said, yeah, I'd love to come. So we did that. And, and again, long story short, a couple weeks later, I learned, because at that point, it wasn't necessary for him to tell me, I learned he was a youth pastor. What I knew he was was someone who just made me feel good and made me feel like I was worth something. And he said, hey, I've got this youth revival this week. You mind if I come pick you up, take the youth revival? And I said, man, I'd love to go. And it was at that youth revival I walked forward and, and gave my life to Jesus Christ. And yes. You know, and, and, and the church embraced me. It wasn't enough for me just to be a number that they counted. Okay, we had one more salvation today. They knew this kid was screwed up, and they were going to have to help me. And uh, so they did. They, they got involved in my life. They got me into an after-school program. You know, I was one of those good D-minus students, you know, just barely hanging in there. And uh, so they got me into a program that helped me. They got me a job edu education program because I figured... My way of life was, if you had a job, you lived for the paycheck. Once you got the paycheck, you didn't need a job anymore. You got money. And uh, that's not very sustainable very long. So they helped me with that. And what they really did was a group of them got together and, and got enough money together to get me out of the town I was living in and send me to Bible college. You know what I'm doing today, what I'm doing all over the world because of one person. That's the honest truth. That's how powerful that is. One person came to the loser's table when I was 16 years old and asked me if I would have lunch with them. 
one person. Now look what God is doing. Yes. Kindness matters. <laughs> Kindness makes a difference. And real quick, I want to I talk about, no, let me, let me stop there. Let me, you know, I stopped in the first service, and then we stop again. You know, this week on Wednesday, just this past Wednesday at 7 o'clock in the morning, I was in my office by myself. I always try to get in before everybody else does where it's quiet and, and pray and just get along with the Lord. And I was praying. I wasn't really praying for this service. I was just praying, God, continue to use me and give me wisdom, give me guidance. And all of a sudden, God placed this service on my heart. If you're here today and you're caught in a cycle of hopelessness, today's your day for freedom. I want you to know, if you're there, I know what you're going through. You don't think you can get out. You think it's, you're stuck. You're not. Jesus Christ, in that prayer time, told me that he wants to set people free at plain view first from being stuck in a cycle of hopelessness. If you're living from one bad thing to another, if your whole life consists of just waiting for the next bad thing to happen, Jesus Christ wants to break that off of you. He wants to set you free. Today. You listening? He wants to set you free today. And, and, and I know what it is to be bound, and I know what it is to be set free. World of difference. And it happens when you, you can't do it. You've been trying to do it by yourself long enough. And I'm going to tell you, you won't win. Because there is an enemy that's there to kill and destroy you, and he's going to keep you in that cycle. But one trip to the altar, Jesus Christ can just break it. And uh, so at the end of this service today, I know we've got some things we've got to do because it's one day to feed the world. But at the end of this service today, if that's you, I want to personally pray with you today. If you're caught in a cycle of hopelessness, today's your day. Don't forget, there's a lot of things going to happen between now and the end of the service. Don't free, if you're caught, I want to pray with you today because I believe Jesus Christ wants to set some people free today. Amen? Amen. Let me, real quick, in the, in the minutes I have left, let me talk to you a little bit about a revolution of compassion. And I believe that a revolution of compassion needs to take place, and that revolution word is kind of a radical word, but a revolutionary is someone who looks at the status quo around them and says, you know what, this is not good enough. We could do better than this. We could do something about it. Revolutionaries look at the amount of change that needs to take place around them and perhaps around the world instead of averting their eyes from it and acting like they don't see it. They look at the situation and say, you know what, we can do something about that. We can be the answer. If all of us pull together, we can do something. Revolutionaries join forces with other people with the same cause and the same drive and the same vision and says together we can make a difference. A revolution of compassion. You know, Jesus himself, when he started his earthly ministry, made a bold statement of faith. It was kind of what he based everything on from that point on when he said, I want you to know that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to set at liberty those that are bound, to open the eyes of the blind. Jesus said, that's what I'm called to do. And Jesus is saying, what I have done, you will do even greater. This revolution of compassion that this church gets behind and says we're gonna make a difference we understand that the thief comes to kill and destroy, but Jesus Christ says, I've come to give life and to live life more abundantly. It's that freedom. It's that freedom. And a lot of times, you know, if, 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 the, if our enemy can't destroy us, he will devalue us and devalue human life to where they just feel like they're nothing. And then even... Even greater than that, I believe our enemy at times influences the culture where the culture itself devalues and treats people like they're expendable, like they don't exist. But Jesus Christ says, I've come that they might have life. That's what Jesus has called us to. And compassion revolutionaries perceive that the problem can be fixed they catch the vision, one simple act of kindness at a time. If you don't know what acts of kindness are, just Google it. 
there's all kinds of things you can do. It's simple stuff. Witnessing, being a Christian, being an example for Christ is not that hard to do. You don't have to learn things to do. You just do. Things like simple things, like open the door for people, and it just it shocks them. And, 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 and you look at them, and you just say, God bless you, and I always say thank you. And I'm telling you, once you start doing that kind of stuff, it's addictive. I love doing it because I love seeing the surprise of people in the mean, hateful world that we live in to know that Christ-like people are out there and we love people and we're kind people. Kindness makes a difference. Um, you know, every, every missionary that, that you come across will stand and tell you great stories and we have to. We report back to you. Here's what God's doing all over the world. And that's what I've done this morning. Here's what God's doing all over the world. And I'm so humbled that God is using us to do that. Again, I was there when we had nothing. I was there when we were picking through these big cardboard boxes of food that grocery stores were throwing away. And we were picking it out so we could give it away to people who are hungry. I remember doing all that. And then to see where we're at today, it's just a remarkable journey of God's power and God's grace. But I'm, I'm going to tell you why I get up every day. Here's what drives me. That's all great, but here's what drives me every day. Yes, we're feeding 400,000 children every single day, every single school day. We're feeding 400,000 children. But here's what I see. I see the thousands of children that are on a waiting list today to get into the feeding program. We do what we do with great excellence we have a purpose, we have a plan, and we follow it. But I still see these kids outside the program that are just waiting. They're on the list. They're just waiting to get in, and we got to have the finances and the resources to get them in. You know, I was in, in Cebu, Cebu, Philippines not long ago, and we were inside the city dump. And inside that city dump, literally hundreds and hundreds of families have made these little makeshift shelters, and they live inside the city dump. And inside that city dump, they, they scrounge for food, and they get items that they can clean up and sell in the market for some money. Well, we set up a feeding program right inside the city dump. And uh, so one, during one of those feeding program days, I was looking at what was happening around the, uh, the, the, the center, and I noticed these boys were in, in this heap of trash, and they were running after some. But they weren't laughing. They weren't playing. They weren't having a good time. They were serious about whatever it is they were running after. So I walked over and found out they were running and catching rats. And then they were taking it behind the building and degutting it like you would a deer. Put it on the fire because that's all they had to eat. Or in, in Kenya at one of the centers and the cooks that after they had finished cooking all day long, the pots and the pans, I noticed this one cook was putting those pots and pans outside the back door only to find kids with stones and sticks waiting so they could scrape the bottom of those pots just to get something out of it, just to eat. That's what drives me. We currently have over 200,000 children on our waiting list, and that's, that's not to do anything to you other than just that's just what it is. And uh, that's what we're driven to do. Again, the feeding program just opens up the ministry to an entire family. And we're able to minister Jesus Christ. And uh, again, thank you for what you've done. But thank you so much for what you're going to do. Stand alongside Convoy of Hope. 